Good morning and welcome to New Covenant Worship Center. My name is Reverend Sam Brady. It's my joy to welcome you to service today. Uh, we have a very special sermon from Bishop James Marquis titled, It Is Well. So sit back, relax, enjoy the presence of the Lord, worship along with us, and we will see you at the end of the program. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside There's a better life There's a better life If you got pain He's a pain taker if you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, a savior, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves wanting. Fire. We've all run the things we know just ain't right. And there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need
Bibles, go with me this morning, or this afternoon, to John chapter 6. And we're going to discuss that there's no offering too small for God to bless, for God to accomplish what he wills with it. John chapter 6, uh, beginning at the, uh, the first verse. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, seeing a great multitude coming toward him. He said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he knew, sorry, excuse me, but this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed, distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the power, uh, excuse me, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning, or this afternoon. What I want to uh, draw your attention to is, you know, so many times we, uh, and, I, and I've been guilty of this too, God, if you put this extravagant amount of money in my hand, I will sow it into the kingdom. God, if, if you put this huge amount of a gift in my hands, I will put it to work in the kingdom of God. I will sow it in the kingdom. I will put it to work in the church. But here in this story, all Jesus needed was a little boy's lunch. No gift is too small for God to bless and for God to put to work and accomplish what God will do with it. We saw right there Jesus teaching Philip a lesson. Told them, you know, asking Philip, testing him. What are you going to feed him? It's a lot of people. Did you, did you prepare snacks? This isn't BBS. You know, they need more than, you know, cookies and juice. I, I can just see the white leaving Philip's face. Two hundred denarii of food. It's like, well, touch this. You know, I, I didn't budget for this, but that's okay. Jesus had. And Andrew, who's most famous for being Simon Peter's brother, <laughs> said, "Lord, there's a, a lad here." with five pieces of bread and two fish. But what is that against so many? But that's okay. Jesus' faith was already activated. He said, you make the people sit down. And it said, then Jesus took it. 
He took the gift that was given. And he blessed it. And he gave it to the disciples. And the disciples fed the people. 5,000 people. Actually, 5,000 men. We don't know about women and children. And Basically, a little more than the population of the city of Jackson, just down the road here, fed with one little boy's lunch. No gift is too small when Jesus takes it. No gift is too small, freely given out of love. I can just see the little boy. Jesus, I know the people are hungry, but you can have my lunch. And everyone had as much as they want. So much so that Jesus said, Go get the leftovers. Collect. Don't waste what God has done. Because when God takes that little lunch and multiplies it, he met the need. And how does God meet needs? Abundantly. He is a God of abundance. So much so that there was a basket of fragments for each apostle. Not for their personal gain, but for Jesus to prove to them, he, he is their supply. He is their Jehovah Jireh. So you might feel like, God, I'm not a, I'm not a big tither. I tithe my, my 10%. I'm faithful in what I do. God, I, I, I sow and I, I offer the capacity you know, I am in my own personal finances. But all it takes is for Jesus to take that gift. And when he multiplies it, he'll put it to work in the kingdom in a, in a way that you could never imagine. I, I can't help but believe that little boy never knew a day of hunger in his life. I can't help but believe that much like the, uh, the widow woman in the Old Testament, whenever she went back to that, her meal bin, there was always meal there. So whatever your gift is, it's not too small for Jesus to bless. It's not too small. It's not insignificant. No, I'm not up here calling for X amount of people to give so many thousands of dollars, that's, if God told me to, I would, but that's not what I'm doing. What I am telling you is, you have a gift that Jesus will take and bless. And it's not just your money. That talent that you don't think means anything, that desire to serve that you don't think means anything or impact the kingdom, Jesus wants to take that gift and multiply it. He wants to take that gift and bless a multitude with it. That little boy didn't know that there's five barley loaves, there's two roasted fish his mom gave him that morning. It was going to change the lives of a multitude. Thousands. People whose face he'll never see. People the little boy's face we don't even know his name we just know he's a lad and not one of Higgins' lads but forever etched the story so impacted God that he put it in his word what a testimony what a testimony of a gift not a ten thousand dollar seed that somebody delivered to the to the pastor's offices because they wanted to hand deliver it to the man of God and 
you know, curry some favor, a simple lunch that Jesus took and he gave thanks and he put it to work in the kingdom. So today, whatever the devil is telling you is insignificant in your life, Jesus says, it can change the world. Give it to me. Give it to me, says God. And I will take it, and I will bless it, and I will distribute it and put it to work. Just give it to me. You know, your, your, your 50 cent offering in the missions offering might be what God takes and multiplies. Multiplies time and time again. You know, our missionary teams have seen, they have seen miracles of abundance. When they didn't have enough food for the feeding, but God kept blessing. God kept producing so that every family was sent home with, with, with the ration that was needed, but they didn't have enough food. But God blessed, God multiplied. It's no different with the gift that Jesus has put in your hand, whether it be financial, whether it be your talent, whether it be a song you just want to sing to him in private, give it to him. Let him bless it. Amen? If you're ready to give today, let's get our offering ready. As we move into this portion of the service, for our friends watching at home and partners wishing to participate and perhaps you have a little seed that you want to sow but you don't think it's significant God will take your seed and God will multiply it and he will change the world with it and if you want to participate feel free to send your gift to New Covenant Worship Center P.O. Box 847 Jackson, Ohio 45640 and watch what Jesus does with what you think is insignificant. Amen? Amen? If you have your tithe and offering ready, let's hold it before the Lord as we declare, speak life, and bring ourselves into qualifying agreement with what God's word says belongs to us as tithers, sowers, and givers. Amen? Declare with me now. Upon the authority of God's word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Good measure, pressed down, Shaken together and running over, men will give to me. I am a tither. I bring my tithe into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not room enough to receive it. I live in a season of prosperity. We receive jobs and better jobs raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts canceled, royalties received, my whole family saved and walking with God, in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing, I am blessed coming in, I am blessed going out. All that I do prospers now, in Jesus' name, amen.
talk to you for a few minutes this, this afternoon, this morning, this afternoon, today. I think that's a better idea. Thank you. I'll call it today. I want to talk to you for a little bit today uh, about it is well. It is well. Uh, I don't know if you're a note taker. Uh, I don't know if you're a recorder or whatever that you might be doing, but I suggest that you take all you can get out of this, as I'm going to, maybe in the next half hour, give you something that could be months worth of preaching and teaching. I don't know that it won't turn into that, but right now, at least for today, you have to worry, you know, a few minutes you'll get out here, everything will be all right, you can go home, eat your supper, everything will be good. It is well. Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 4, uh, the 8th through the 37th verse. We will do our best to uh, give you the multimedia center version of all of that. I'm going to read it to you out of the New King James Version. Uh, I will probably just go ahead and uh, spend the energy to read that entire passage to you that I want to read. Um, I don't know that I can without stopping, but um, I want to read that to you, and then I want to try to give you a synopsis of what the Lord uh, has spoken to my heart about, okay? 2 Kings 4, 8 through 37 in the New King James. When you get there, 
I hear pages flipping. My God, for all of you old school folk in the house, hallelujah, thank you for flipping your Bibles. The rest of you, I know that on your iPhone, you went there immediately, but bless God. Say amen when you're there. Amen. All right. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through 37. The Bible says, Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. This is why I like to say that this was in his Baptist years, because she would not have had to persuade a Pentecostal to eat. <laughs> Don't take that out as doctrine. It's not. It was just a passing pun. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, Look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please, let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand. So it will be, whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. And it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. That's what makes me think that he's now become Pentecostal because he eats and lays down for a nap. <laughs> of course, I'm not referring to any of the Pentecostal company present, just telling you the generalization. Verse 12, then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite woman. When he had called her, she stood before him. And he, said, and he said to him, Say now to her, Look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. So he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Actually, she has no son, and her husband is old. So he said, Call her. When he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, About this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, No, my Lord, men of God, do not lie to your maidservant. Without any explanation, I'm going to tell you now I know that he's Pentecostal. But the woman conceived, which is confirmation that he was Pentecostal, and bore a son when the appointed time had come, of which Elisha had told her. And the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father to the reapers, and he said to his father, My head, my head. So he said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. When he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees, the simport, and he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. She shut the door upon him and she went out. Then she called to her husband and said, Please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. That I may run to the man of God and come back. So he said, Why are you going to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It is well. Then she, sat, then she saddled a donkey and said to her servant, Drive and go forward, and do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. And so she departed, went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. So it was, when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to his servant Gehazi, Look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, is it well with you? 
Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it is well. Now when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet, and Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. So she said, did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, get yourself ready, take my staff in your hand, and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. If anyone greets you, do not answer him, but lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, Oh, God, you've got to help me right here. You want to get to the heart of Elisha, speak those words. Come on. Yeah. You want to get to the heart of Elisha, speak those words. And she didn't know him, but he did. That's what he said over and over and over to Elijah. As your soul lives, as you live, I won't leave you. My God. I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Now Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on, uh, on the face of the child. And there was neither voice nor hearing. Mm -mm. Therefore he went back to meet him and told him, saying, The child has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed. He went in, therefore, shut the door behind the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. He went up and lay on the child, put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands, and he stretched himself out on the child. And the flesh of the child became warm. He returned and walked back and forth in the house. And again he went up and stretched himself out on him. And then the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite woman. So he called her. And when she came in to him, he said, pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word today. Father, let your word and your word only be spoken here. Teach us. Help us to understand what it is you want us to know today. It is important for us to understand just a few things as we begin to talk about this. I said I was staying up here, but I, I'm Pentecostal. So I'm going to come down here a little bit. I don't have to project as far down here. It helps me. Elisha has gone to Shunem. Shunem is a city of Issachar. According to Joshua, Shunem is a city of Issachar. It means a place of twin resting places, a place of double support, a place of quiet and tranquility. This is where Elisha comes and begins to turn in, strikes up a relationship with a notable woman there who's powerful, begins to deal with her. It's important for you to understand that this happened, and we, it has to be by the will of God, by the working of God, that these things take place, because we're never doing things unless God is leading us to do them if we're in the will of God. 
as he is turning in there, as he's coming through there, this woman decides that think it'd be a good idea to make him a place to rest. Here in our house, which is one place of rest, we're going to build another room on that's going to be your place of rest. A place of two resting places. A place of double support. As he is there resting on the bed, he becomes concerned because of her concern for them, her hospitality. He calls Gehazi, never talks to the woman really individually until later except through Gehazi says, I want to know what to do for her. What does she want? What does she need? Don't worry about that. That's just ice falling off the top of the, the house. Thank God. That's how I know we're Pentecostal. There's so much fire in the house that the snow's melting off the roof. That's what I'm saying, although some would say they know fire, but there is. I probably, it's in me if it ain't in you. You get what I'm saying? All right. This Man of God is concerned that something be done for her. I want to know what you want me to do. So I dwell among my own people. I'm good. I don't need a thing. I'm, I'm here to take care of you. Don't you start worrying about me. I'm here to take care of you. Well, Gehazi, what are we going to do for her? And Gehazi says, well, actually, she has no son. And her husband's old. He says, call her back, talk to her a little more. We're going to find out what's going on. She comes back and stands in the door. The door leads into the second place of rest, not first. She stands on the inside of her place of rest, in the doorway of his place of rest, and he says, next year at this time, you will embrace a son. Oh, no. No, my Lord. No, don't, don't, don't lie to your handmaid. Don't, don't deceive me. My husband's old. I've got everything going on. It's all right. I've learned to live with the stigmatism of not having any children. I've never bore a son. I'm satisfied with life. But, you know, don't, don't, don't lie to, to your handmaid. Nevertheless, she conceives. In about a year's time, she's embracing the son that was of her promise. Now, God has just changed her life. The man of God has just changed everything about her life. No matter how satisfied she was, the longing of her heart was, I want a child. Because now God's going to give her what she really wants. The man of God couldn't give her nothing, but God said, I know what she wants. Amen. And I'm going to give her what she wants. And now she's holding this little man on her knees. I thought about that this morning, sitting in the back of the, the church, or this afternoon, sitting back in the church, and I saw Grandma up here. Uh, holding the babies in her lap and talking to them and other people were talking to them and cooing and going and it just took me back to this. Here's this mother with this promised child sitting on her lap and how everything is going on in this place of rest and tranquility. Life just got extremely better for her. I don't need a thing. I'm fully satisfied. I dwell among my own people. There's nothing you can do for me. I've got it all. I'm here to take care of you. But I'm going to tell you something. You can't give to God and God not give you back. Come on, man. You're not going to give to God and God not give you back. And while you give to God what you think He wants and needs, God will give you what He knows you want and need. Amen. 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 I'm hitting a few things here that I'm not coming back and teaching on. I told you this is an overview. The child grows. We don't know exactly how old he is, but he decides to get up one morning and go out to his father in the field. And as he's out with his father in the field, he cries out to his father, 
my head, my head. The father talks to one of the young servants, says, take the boy, take him home to his mother. And the servant picks the boy up and takes this little boy home to his mother and guess where he puts the boy? On the lap of his mother and he sits there on the lap of his mother until about noon. Sister Jess, this is the same lap that held this little tiny bouncing baby boy when he was first born. And every day, somewhere along the way, he was on that lap, dandled on her knees, and she carried him. But today, he sat on her knees till about noon. She held him from somewhere around mid-morning till noon, and there on her lap, in her arms, he died. He passed away. I am glad that I am recovered to the point that I'm not as emotional as I have been throughout this whole thing because if I tried to tell this a couple of weeks ago, I'd have just stood up here and sobbed before you because it's how emotional I've been. But here is this mother and her child dies on her lap, the child she did not ask for, but it was the longing of her heart and God gave him to her and he sits on her lap and he dies. She gets up from where she is on the porch or in the living room of her place of rest and she picks him up and she takes him not to her bed, not to his bed, but she takes him to the bed of the man of God. She walks through that door where she had stood between the two places of rest and she laid that baby down, well not a baby, it's a young boy, laid him down on the man of God's bed and the Bible says then she turned and she went out and she shut the door. Can you imagine the difficulty of that? laid him on the man of God's bed and turned and walked out. She calls to her husband who was way out in the field but now he's close enough he can hear her call. And she said, send me one of the young men and send me a donkey. I'm going to the man of God. She didn't tell him to come into the house but I noticed that he came along with the young man and the donkey. Just why is it that you're going to see the man of God? It's not new moon. Have you ever noticed how nosy husbands get when you're trying to do something for God? <laughs> it's not the new moon. It's not Sabbath. Why are you going to see the man of God? <sighs> You've got to help me here. What does she say to him? She says... Well, I'm, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to it. She saddles the donkey. She saddles the donkey. What was the purpose of the young man? I ain't figured that out yet. What, to walk the donkey up? <laughs> yeah, he wasn't quick enough. That's exactly right. She's a, she's a mom on a mission. Sends a young man and the donkey. Daddy comes along with it. Dad's standing there and too late. All he cares about is why are you leaving? He won't, won't settle a donkey. you got a young boy that was sent up with the donkey. He's too stupid to settle the donkey. And he ain't fast enough. So she saddles the donkey. She's kind of a strong Pentecost woman. She said, you may have walked the donkey up, and I may have saddled him, but I ain't driving him. You get up there, take the wheel, and you drive this donkey. If I was a horse, I'd run like a horse. That's about all the faster donkey's going to go. <laughs> We're already fighting time. She's in a hurry, and they're riding a donkey. She said, you drive him. Mm -hmm. She said, you go forward and don't you stop unless I tell you to stop. So he drives her fast as he can on that donkey. It's amazing to me how God has everything set in time. For some reason, Elisha and Gehazi didn't have anything else to do 
to sit up on the hill, look over top of the city, see what was coming and going. That's why I know they were Pentecostal. <laughs> Nosy about everybody else's business. <laughs> so, so Elisha's sitting there for the Gehazi, probably, you know, sipping coconut milk. I mean, I don't know. And he said, look, yonder. Yonder comes Shunammite woman. What would cause him to notice her? She's coming fast. She ain't just leisurely riding a donkey. She's got someone sound like Yosemite Sam. Yah mule! Yah mule! Well, that'd make anybody, even the prophet, take notice. He says, you go see her. When she gets up there, she comes to the man of God, and he's asking questions. Understand, he's turning the words around. When she left home, she said, it is well. When he gets there, she gets there, and he gets there, he starts saying, is it well? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with you? Is it well, well, first of all, ain't no woman going to be going to see the man of God if it's not new moon or Sabbath unless something ain't right. One of the kids get hurt. I hit my hand on something and I yell, ow, shake my hand. And people say, are you okay? And my answer to them is if you have to ask, no. <laughs> what about my cry for help? Did you not understand? That hurt. So he already knows something's going on. I'm not making anybody look bad. I'm telling you how the story unfolded in real life. Is it well with your husband? He was old. Is it well with you? Is it well with the child? And she said, it is well. According to Young's literal translation of the Word of God, every time she said it is well, she uttered one word, peace. The literal translation of it is well is peace. Every time he asked her a question, he said, do you have peace? Does your husband have peace? Do you have peace? Does the child have peace? She started off at home with her dead son on the prophet's bed. And when they asked her what was wrong, she said, peace. Amen. Amen. Gehazi, get yourself ready to go. Take my staff. Run as fast as you can. And when you get there, you lay your, my staff on that child's face. If anybody speaks to you, don't speak to them. Don't speak to nobody on the way. You just go straight there. Maybe everything will be all right. I need to tell people in leadership role, whether it's stand in front of the church, stand in front of a business, stand in front of your home, your house, there are times that your staff cannot do the job. It's going to require you. Right. And I'm not talking about your powerful shepherd's hook. I'm talking about those that you've delegated authority to in your life. There are times that they cannot do the job. You're going to have to go yourself. <clears throat> Elijah said, Elisha said, it's all taken care of. My staff take care of it. She says to him, up until now I have said peace, peace, peace. But I'm telling you, that as your soul lives and as the Lord lives, I will not leave you. Amen. The next phrase is, he follows her. Every time in Elisha's life that he said, wow. as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you, they had to leave. 
So this woman looks at him as he's attempting to stay where he's at and not go, just someone else to do it. She says, oh no, you don't understand the gravity of the hour. As your soul lives and as the Lord lives, I won't leave you. And then she turns to leave. And the Bible says, he went with her. Get to the house. And just before they get in, Gehazi comes running back. He said, Master, I've done as you've told me. And I put your staff on the face of the child. But he has not awakened. And I thought it interesting how he said it. There is no voice and there is no hearing. God made us a speaking spirit. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He was the word of God in his day. Not Gehazi, not his staff. Elisha was the word of God. Gehazi's report to him was, there's no voice and there's no hearing. There can't be hearing until the word of God is spoken. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But if the word of God doesn't speak, nothing can hear. Right. He comes in. He talks to the Lord. He goes over and lays down on the child, puts his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands, and he just lays there expecting him to live. And the little boy got warm. I have other stories to tell you, but I can't tell you right now. When people die, they get cold. He gets up and begins to walk back and forth in the house. I don't know where he went. He went. I don't know if he was in his room. I don't know if he went out on the other side and was in the other part of the house. But he walked back and forth. And then it said he came back. And when he came back in, he did exactly the same thing. He put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands. He stretched himself out on the child. And the Bible says that the child sneezed seven times. Hold on a minute now. God, God, God. When the thief gets found, anybody? When the thief gets found, he has to restore seven times. seven times. This woman's promise had been stolen. Would you agree with that? That was her promise. That was her, was her miracle. It was her life. Got stolen. So he sneezed seven times. And then he opened his eyes. My God, I'm glad ain't no one have to die to get it. But he was seven times more the promise when he opened his eyes than he was before he laid down in death. When he opened his eyes, Elisha said, Gehazi, you need to go get his mama. Go get this Shunammite woman. This woman who's used to rest in two places. This woman who's used to tranquility. This woman who received her promise. This woman who, who, who took hold of the Word of God even though she didn't ask for it and tell her to come here. And she came there again to the same doorway she had built. To the same place that she had walked in troubled and walked out of troubled and shut the door behind her troubled. And he said to her, you pick up your son. She went in, bowed on the floor at his feet, went over to the bed, and she picked up her son, carried him back out into the house, and I wonder where they went and what they did. This thing started with him dying on her lap. This thing started with her laying him, her laying him on the bed. Mm -hmm. Why? I thought to myself, why didn't Elisha pick him up 
and take her, take him, and present him, her, him to her, to his mother, because he didn't lay him down there. Right. This is something she did. She took her promise that died before her eyes. She took her promise that died before her eyes. She didn't even want it. She got really used to it. She picked him up, carried his dead body. She carried him to the Word of God. I'm going to carry you to the place of peace that I built for the man of God. I'm going to take you to the place of peace that I built for the man of God and I'll lay you on his bed. And then the only word that she would speak until she got her promise back was peace. The only word she would speak until her promise was restored, the way that she needed to be in her heart was peace. No complaints. No ragging nobody out. No running nobody down. No answering anybody's questions. Questions. Why are you doing? Peace. Where are you going? Peace. Ask Brother Man of God, do you have any peace? God told me he's asking people, do you have any peace? It's what we're missing. Our peace gets robbed. We don't have any peace. God's asking people, do you have peace? Our answer is, no, God, I'm unhappy with my husband. No, God, I'm unhappy with my wife. No, God, I'm unhappy with my children. No, God, I'm happy with my job. No, God, I'm unhappy with the stimulus. No, God, I'm unhappy with the church. No, God, I'm unhappy with everything. But the answer when your peace has been robbed, because you were happy. Your answer when your peace has been robbed is peace. God is no respecter of person. You're living in Shunem, a place of double blessing. You're living in a place of double peace, a place of double support in the kingdom of God. The situation is that the enemy takes our peace. That's his job. And we think it's time to move on I'm dealing with people that are moving on in marriages. That's not your problem. People are moving on in jobs. That's not your problem. People are moving on in every area. The problem is that you've lost your peace. You've lost your peace because your promise died. As you see it, your promise died. It may not even be what you wanted. At least you didn't think, but you got used to it. And it became the promise of your life. And then you held it on your knees while no one else knew anything about it, and it died on you. But you don't run from the Word. You don't run away from the answer. She picked up her promise and went and laid it down on the Word. Then she ran to the Word. And every time that he asked, do you have peace? She's got a dead baby laying at home. I could have understood when she didn't want to trouble her husband because he wouldn't even saddle the donkey, I understand. When she got to the man of God, he said, do you have any peace for your husband? Peace for yourself, peace for your child. Her words to him was, peace. How hard would that be when your baby's laying dead on the bed? I've been where children have died and you have to pry the child from the arms of the mother or the father. been there with the funeral director when they've had to pry a child from the arms of a mother or a father. 
And she laid him down on the bed of the prophet and turned around and closed the door and said, I'm going to the Word of God and I have peace. I have peace. And you and I today let everything disrupt our peace. We walk around losing weight and losing hair with ulcers, troubled, singing the songs of Zion, listening to every word we can listen to, and we refuse to confess because of our problems that we have peace. But all she would say, it is well, go look it up. Young's literal translation of the word of God. Every time she said it is well, she said one word, peace. Peace. Every time she was asked, how's it going with your job? Well, I don't like Big Bill now that he's been promoted to top dog down at the plant. No, 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 no. The answer is peace. I don't like, you know, my wife since she got her new job, my husband's got, no, no, no. The answer is peace. I don't want to do it with my kids. The answer is peace. I don't know what to do about my own life. And I don't know what to do. The answer is peace. And every time that someone asks you, the answer is peace. And then you take the Word of God with you. When she left Mount Carmel, she took the Word of God with her. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I'm not, I'm not visiting, I'm habitating. You're going with me. You know, what we do is we get our prayer life all where we think it needs to be, but then we get up and go tackle our problem without the Word of God. She refused to leave there without the Word of God. Oh no, I'm taking the Word with me. Yeah. And he went. And when she got there, as he walked in my own mind down the steps from his place, and he walked down into the living room and got ready to go out her front door. There she sat, over there in her chair where she had sat so broken hard a little bit ago with that young lad on, here, on her lap. He's probably saying, Mom, I want to go outside and play. No, 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 baby, you're going to sit on Mama's lap. I want to go back out with Dad and the workers. I want to play with the field and, you know, throw cow pucks at my friends. No, 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 no. You're going to sit on mama's lap. But mama, I'm feeling good. Everything's good, I know. But mama needs a little more peace with you right now. You're going to sit right here on my lap. I have found out that whatever the enemy has to do to take your peace, he'll take it. He'll wreck your life. He'll ruin your life. He'll ruin your plans. He'll take away from you everything that you thought you needed, everything that you thought you had. He'll take away everything that he can get away from you until that he can get you uh, some way to try to deny the peace that belongs to you. This little woman is, a, is, a, is, is an example to us that the only answer that we need to give is, I have peace. When hell can't take your peace, he cannot continue to hold your promise. You don't understand how long it's been this way. I don't care how long it's been that way. When the devil cannot take your peace, he cannot hold your promise. He has to give it back. You can't have it back without the Word of God. And the Word of God is with you. Jesus is the Word of God. And he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will go with you all the way, even unto the end of the age. I'm getting ready to do some things, Lord, that I need to do. And you know what they are, Jesus. But as your soul lives, and as you've let me live, I will not leave you, Lord. He'll go with you every time. Yeah. He'll go with you every time. Do you have peace today? 
Where is your peace today? Don't tell me about your peace where things are good. Where is your peace where your dream has ended? Where is your peace where everything that you think God wanted you to do seems like it can't happen now? Where is your peace? What do you think now? Peace? Is it well over here? Peace. Is it well over here? Peace. Is it well here? Peace. Sometimes in translation, we lose the importance of what's really being said. It is well is wonderful, but it's a flip of one word away from, is it well? I quit asking people, how you doing? I don't want them to tell me. Sometimes I can't bear with the response. So I tell people, now you're doing good today, looking well. They might be ugly as a mud fence in a rainstorm. But I tell them, you're looking good. Ain't you lying, Bishop? No, I'm prophesying. It is well is a one conjunction flip from is it well. But the answer is peace. It is well. Peace. So where's your peace? More importantly, what are you going to do to get it back? What are you going to do to have your promise back? This is the most crucial thing that I'm going to say as I end this service. You picked your dead promise up and laid it down. God's going to come back into the middle of what you're doing. He's going to go with you and He's going to help you. But He will not pick your dream up. You're going to have to do it. I'll go with you. I'll raise your dream. I'll bring it back within your grasp. And there it will lay. Right there. I'm not going to pick it up and hand it to you. I'm not going to carry it downstairs and set it on your lap. I'm going to call you just like I did the first time. And I'm going to bring you into it. And I'm going to say, see, there your promise is living. But you pick it up. You pick it up off the bed. You pick up your son. You pick up your child. It is at that place that the only thing you can do is fall down at his feet and worship him and realize what a miraculous thing he's doing by giving you back the dream that you thought was dead. And then pick it up. Don't let it go outside and play for a while. Don't let it run out with daddy for a while. Mama, hold that on your lap. Be thankful for it. Because that's your peace. You know they weren't the same two people when she sat after he had been raised. See, their life had been totally changed. The little boy wasn't aware of it as much as his mama. But when she held him on her lap this time, there were different feelings, I guarantee you, than the first time. There was an appreciation and an understanding beyond what any of us can understand unless you're there this morning saying, God, I need the peace you're talking about. I'm back for my dream, God. I'm, I'm, I'm going to quit giving up on it. But... You've got to pick your dream up and you've got to start caring for it, but you care for it differently this time. Whatever it takes, I'll care for this. Because I know the pain of losing it. God didn't take it from you. The devil didn't take it from you. It happened beyond anybody's hope, scope, or imagination. But you laid it down. Thank God you laid it down in the Word. So now that you could come back with the resurrection power and pick it up in the Word. This time, not let it go. Stand to your feet with me. I make no apologies for the Word of God today. I only apologize for my energy. But it's returning. 
would have loved to have the energy of 100% to have ministered this word because it makes a difference. But I have delivered my heart what I believe that God has said to deliver and I know that it's real and I know that it's for me and I know that it's for us. I'm after it today. I'm after it today, Lord. I want my dream. Yes. I laid it down. You didn't take it from me. Nobody took it from me. I laid it down. I couldn't help what happened. Like they couldn't help what happened, but I laid it down. But thank God I laid it down in the Word. The devil hadn't been successful in running me off the Word. I laid it down in the Word. So now I can take the Word of God with me. I can see that dream resurrected. And maybe it's not a dream. Maybe it's dreams, plural. God's going to raise it. Might take some while, some time. Might have to lay on it a little while. Get up, walk around a little while. Come back and lay down on it again a little while. Because that thing's going to sneeze seven times. Open its eyes. And then it's going to lay right there. It's going to lay right there. Until that the Word speaks to your heart and says, You pick it up. Because if you don't, even though it's now living, you can't have it. I fell down humbly at his feet and said, Oh my God, I'm so sorry for who I've been, for what I've been, and how I've been. But God, if you'll help me to live here, if you'll help me to be where I need to be, God, I'll pick the dream up and I'll run with it this time. This time I'll know how to treat it. So pick up your pick up your son she got up off the floor at his feet and she picked up her son and she walked out listen 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 when she walked out this time she didn't shut the door when she walked out the last time she didn't shut the door Bill it's me and you to lay our dream down and shut the door and go looking for God. When she walked back out with her promise, she didn't shut the door. These are all symbolisms that we need to look at because they're powerful. Where is your peace? Even when you've tried to put a smile on for people, let everything, everyone think it's all right. It's not because the one thing that's missing way down inside is your peace is not there. Well, I'll build a new relationship. I'll, I'll build something different. No, no, no. You've got to have peace. You've got to take the same old thing that was and treat it differently. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your anointing. I thank you, Lord God, for your people that are here today to hear your word. I thank you for your strength to preach and to teach your word. And now I'm asking God, do not let this word fall on empty ears and empty hearts. Let this word take root deeper than anything else we have growing or maturing in our hearts or our lives. You've already promised that your word would not return to you void, and I believe you for that. So it will accomplish what you've set it forth to do. But no matter what you do today, Lord, no matter how much you resurrect, if we each one don't pick it up, and walk out with it don't mean absolutely nothing. Today's a day of decision. I hear hear you asking, is it well? With everything I know how to answer, Lord, before this people in prayer, peace. Peace, Prince of Peace. Peace, Prince of Peace. Shalom, Prince of Peace. And I walk out with it today. I want, I'm not going to leave this place 
thus I'm carrying my dream. And I'm going to care for it like I've never cared for it in my life. And I thank you for it. Would you just lift your hands for a moment before the Lord? Would you just... Thank you for joining us again this week for service. Uh, we hope you were blessed and changed by the presence of the Lord. If you have a testimony, a prayer request, or perhaps you gave your heart to Jesus during the service, you know, we would really love to hear from you. Our contact information is on the screen below. Also, please like and share. Uh, help us get the word out and spread the gospel. Until then, we'll see you again next week.